Okay, good morning everybody. I see we've just passed the 100 mark. Amazing. Um, thank you all, everybody for who's logging in and joining in, uh, which I think is going to be a very exciting discussion um, here at EMA. Um, <clears throat> quick house housekeeping. Uh, we, we are recording this webinar. We will be sharing it um, very much in the open arena, so across the industry as well. Um, so either other associations and individuals can, can look at that um, and see it. Um, I encourage people to engage um, through the chat room, the chat space, and add comments, make notes, ask questions, etc. We'll be picking up on those in in the chat in the chat room. So it'd be great to get people interacting with the webinar that, that way. So this week um, at EMA, we've kicked off what we've been calling our back to live discussion. Um, and I'll tell you, it's a big discussion. Uh, on Tuesday, we talked with three property, sorry, four properties from across Europe and heard, from, heard particularly from Spain and Switzerland who are now open for events. In fact, Switzerland can do events up to a thousand people. The maximum they can have in one room was 300. Um, but things are progressing very quickly there. And, and it was a very interesting conversation that webinar is also available on our website if you want to go back and have, and have a look at that for anybody who hasn't um, but over the past few weeks a number of EMA members have been working together in putting together questions thoughts and processes on what back to live uh, will could look like um, in the coming months this work is and I'll reiterate this work is a long way for, uh, from complete um, and as of yet, we don't, we don't, as particularly as of yet, we don't have sight of the government guidelines, but we felt it was important that we needed to get the ball rolling and start the conversation, collaborating, thinking about, you know, what we do, how we do it, what it's going to look like. So what you see in the initial draft documents, again, that are on our website. So if you haven't seen those, please feel free to download those. Um, but again, they are draft. We will be updating them and we'll be keeping them up to date as we go along. Um, so please take a, take a look at those. But from a strategic point of view, we've discussed at both length at the council and what, the, what we call the EMA leadership group, which is about 50 heads of department, the issues and challenges. Um, and whilst there's lots of tactical detail around the challenge, which is, you know, room numbers, layout, sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. To me and the team is the big question is more about the strategic question. And the strategic question is very much about is when and how are people, companies, going to be ready to return to live events? And what will be needed to, what, will, what we need to look at, uh, what we need to talk about, what do we need to be offering to help this happen? Yeah, every, every attendee every, is an individual, every business is a brand. Um, and there are many, many nuances that need to be taken into consideration as we move forward. A lot of what are physical tactical challenges, uh, but to get the ball, ball rolling, we first need um, to be able to address the, the psychological, strategic drivers and challenges first. So I'm hoping that this discussion will open up across the industry um, with, in dialogue. Sorry, to, to be able to help drive the assurances that there are safe and practical ways of creating events that, that can meet and exceed business objectives whether that's hybrid, hub and spoke, virtual, celebrations, recognitions, etc. Um, and it's going to be an interesting process, I believe, I think, to, to watch over the, com over the coming months. I want to also say a big thank you to the EMA members uh, with Christopher, Anna and Mark, who's, who've headed up uh, this internally at, at EMA and spent a lot of time aside of their day jobs, which they, they have still very busy day job to help put this together with their extended teams. And today to welcome and, and thank um, Lee from HBAA, Adam from Etc. Venues, and S Semrin from Hyatt Hotels, who've joined as our industry colleagues to in engage in this conversation. Guys, just remind you, you know, so we're gonna talk about the three key areas, keep it sort of like five minutes on those. Let's try and, let's try and have our kind of discussion stuff gone through fairly quickly so that we can then open up into a cross-panel discussion and take some thoughts and views um, 
from, from the panelists. So Chris, I'd like to hand over to you as the chairman of the <laughs> review committee to give us a top line of how you, what you've done, how you've got about it, and then let's get the ball rolling. Cheers. Lovely, thank you, Richard. Um, as Richard said, we, we started this off without knowing exactly, I still don't know exactly what the rules and regulations are for events going ahead. Um, what happened, first of all, was there, all the, all the venues um, closed, all the staff went on furlough. Then there was a huge amount of activity with venues and, venues and um, locations looking at how they were going to go forward with things. So we spent a long, long time at the very beginning going through masses and masses of information um, from hotels, from venues. Um, we looked through websites, we looked at internal documents um, from various EMA members. Um, they produced some absolutely great work. Um, some of the industry players such as Higher Space, MIA, um, they had, again, they had some great documents. Um, a lot of what we've done um, is, as I said, going through these documents and, take, and taking leads and taking advice, uh, taking advice from these great people. Um, the, the final aim is to make it simpler for the corporate planner. Um, as I said, we've been navigating advice, information from venues. Um, our aim is to list, draw together a list of points um, that planners should be aware of, um, rather than creating our own definitive guidelines. Um, we split it mainly into um, th sort of three work tranches. Um, so Anna looked at the um, pre-event um, and all the comms and the legalities that went around that. Uh, Mark looked at the venues um, and uh, what, what we're speaking to venues about before we place business with them. And I took on the what you do on site and looking after the exhibitors as well. Um, so that, that was the three main, main groups we split it into. Um, and Richard, if you could share the screen. Thank you. <clears throat> Technology, hey? <laughs> Here we go. <clears throat> Perfect, thank you very much. And if we could go on to slide two. Um, if Anna, would you like to talk us through your points? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think a big part of what we're doing um, initially is to get stakeholder engagement. I think there's going to be, as Richard already said, some nervousness about going back to live events. So I think having a look at new ways of working, um, getting the buy-in from our stakeholders is going to be really key. And as the event professionals, they're going to come to us to make sure that we've done our diligence to make sure that what we're delivering is going to be safe and right for our staff or for your delegates if it's um, external as well. I think some of the key areas are looking at the pre maybe having a pre-event survey. So letting the business know or letting your delegates know that you plan on holding an event that reassuring them that you've put all the correct health and safety measures in place that you're comfortable you can deliver this to the best of your ability and that you're working close with the venues on their guidelines and again that, that health and safety is paramount i think there's some questions that we would need to ask in advance um, bearing in mind gdpr and what we can and can't ask at this time but particularly around whether they need to self-isolate whether they're showing any symptoms um, making sure that they know and they're aware and responsible for their own behaviours as well and what's expected of them when they come on site. And I think also the joining instructions as well, you're going to have to cover a lot of things. So there's the reassurance about how we would safeguard them, um, outlining what is going to be expected of them, the type of venue that they're going to, what the space is going to be like, are there any social distancing measures in place at that time, what the PPE is going to be at the venues, mm -hmm. how they're going to register themselves on site, whether there's going to be any um, health and safety checks or temperature testing. So all of those things will have to be covered in the pre-event run-up and the registration on site as well. There's um, a lot of discussion around legal and contracts and particularly force majeure and how that has changed or if that has changed 
whether that now includes pandemics. There's also a lot to be said for what you're allowed to sign off on in your company. I certainly at Liberty Global, we only have two people that are allowed to sign off on our events contracts. So whilst that does occasionally hold up the process a little bit because they're two very senior guys and they're also very busy, it also means that you can absolutely dot, you know, cross the T's and dot the I's and make sure you go through your legal system and that they review everything. So we have you know, expert eyes looking at all of our contracts before we sign and commit to any venue. But for anybody that does sign on behalf of their company, it's just making sure that you're comfortable and that you can actually sign and you know what you're signing on, on behalf of the company before you sign that contract. Again, I just touched on the joint instructions, so making sure you cover all of that so people know and your delegates know ahead of time what it is that, they're, that they, they can expect at that event and also that they're comfortable to actually come to the event and whether you look at a hybrid option versus everyone going live on site, um, guidelines permitting obviously for that particular country that they're going to. Um, and it may be that you have to continue to do a hybrid event because some people will either be too nervous to travel or there might be travel restrictions from the company that they're going from and to. So it's looking at all of that and making sure you cover that um, in your, in your um, joint instructions ahead of time as well. And then I think post event, there's been a lot of discussion around having lists and the contact tracing and the onus certainly is on the organizer to keep a track of who has attended. And if there's any uh, recourse after, or if there's anything that should happen or any um, issues that arise post event and the onus is on the business or is on the organizer to give that information to the venues and any of the suppliers that you've worked with for, I believe it's 14 days currently that I'm hearing. Um, but again, working with the venue to see what they need and making sure you have all the information on, on your delegates in case you need to share that post event. Thank you, Anna. Um, over to you, Mark. And next slide, Richard. Thank you, Christopher, and good morning to everyone that's, um, that's watching. I had a quick flick through uh, the participant list and um, lovely to see so many uh, familiar names on there. Um, as Richard mentioned, uh, the documents are all uh, available to download um, on the EMA site. So I won't go through everything that, um, that we put in there, but uh, the group that I was heading up, we were looking at uh, working with suppliers and very much asking people to think about the health and safety protocols. So talking to venues about policies around face coverings, uh, the policies around venue staffing and what their contingency planning is, uh, if staff go off sick. Also, what's their medical policy um, around delegates that are coming into the venues? Are you taking uh, temperatures on arrival? Uh, medical personnel, do you have a doctor or a nurse on site? Um, and also that the kind of overarching thing which I would say to everyone is that um, we found through this process that venues all have, um, they all have a process in place, they all have these guidelines that they've drawn up. So very much when you go out and start engaging with venues, um, this is something that they will have prepared. Now I'd be very surprised if you found any venues that said that they hadn't changed um, their process uh, around COVID-19. Um, we also uh, looked at the contracting um, and it's going to be something that's going to be crucial I think over the next kind of 12 to 24 months and making sure that um, you're asking the right questions around postponement, cancellation, are you having to contract larger meeting spaces now because um, of that social distancing, also delegate attrition, what happens if um, you contract a space but then delegates don't feel comfortable about um, uh, actually attending and your numbers then drop um, and also set up and break down times um, and then when we go into things like space planning um, and thinking about the layout uh, obviously capacities will be impacted um, what other events are taking place um, at the venue on the same day uh, things of like registration and how you're going to manage that process uh, cloakrooms, um, also virtual, thinking about the fact that now uh, highly likely that you're going to have to have a hybrid event. What about those guests that don't want to attend in person? Um, what's, what's the venue's uh, Wi-Fi capability and, and can they do that? Um, and then also when we talk about partner vendors, so uh, many of the planners will have uh, their preferred audiovisual florists that they like to work with. Um, 
uh, not always on a preferred list at venues, but you, you know, you very much do want to partner with them. Um, and so thinking about the equipment that they're bringing into venues, um, who's responsible for cleaning that um, and really for signing that off. Um, so an additional check there to engage. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, lots to think about. That's, uh, that's what we've all found through this. But um, I shall hand it back now to Christopher to, uh, to take us through kind of on-site and, um, and exhibitors. Thank you, Mark. And next slide, please, Richard. Hi, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and last but not least, um, we've got on-site and, and exhibitors. Um, what we, you will find when you look at the documents on the website as well is there's lots of repetition as they go through um, each document as well. So obviously the health and safety um, side, the cleanliness side, that's something you ask before, that's something you speak to your suppliers, that's something that you speak about on site. Um, so you will see um, repetition, but it is important that a, lot of the, a lot of the points that we've made are picked up at each stage. Uh, so last on site and exhibitors, um, one of the main things is going to be about the registration process. So how do you protect the people that are taking people's registration? Where do people stand? How do you make sure they queue okay? Um, how do you make sure there's not lots of large crowds? Um, so the registration process of when you're on site and also when we're working with exhibitors um, is one of the key, key findings for us as well. Um, second part is the on-site verification of health. So who's going to be responsible for that? Um, is it going to be the building going to be taking people's temperatures as they, as they come in? Um, are you going to be asking people to sign on-site declarations of health? Um, also that health part and that registration process as well um, takes us back to whereas before we would have been very accommodating if there had been a last minute delegate turned up that wasn't necessarily on the list. Um, now now it's going to be a lot, lot stricter. Um, there's going to be a lot of events where if your name isn't on the list, you literally aren't going to be able to come in um, because, because the health and the considerations are going to be a lot higher as well. Um, when we're on site, and especially with exhibitors as well, um, we're going to be speaking to them about movement around the building. So what other events are going on? If you've got exclusive use, um, is there just one way in, one way out of buildings? Um, how do you make sure that when the break comes, everybody doesn't dash for the exit door? Um, so that whole movement around the building is going to be very, very important as well. Um, and also as well, who does the um, responsibility lie with? So you we wouldn't be expecting necessarily a venue to be policing our delegates. Um, so that might mean we end up with a lot more event staff on site to be making sure these things happen. Um, the exhibitors one is an interesting, interesting part. Um, Gone are the days, I think, where exhibitors, there's, at the moment, we're just going to be wandering around, casually chatting to everybody, left, right and centre. Um, with the whole exhibitor space, it's probably going to be um, exhibitor appointments when you go and see somebody. Um, in one way, that could be good, because it means that the people that meet people are actually people that want to meet them, rather than a random chat. Um, but as we know, I've got a lot of, a lot of, a lot of suppliers and a lot of contacts that I've made where I've literally just stopped and talked rather than make an appointment to speak to them. Um, lastly, um, on-site exhibit, exhibition collateral, um, so we can see that changing. So there's going to be no bowls of sweets, there's going to be no bowls of piles of shared literature, there's going to be no pens that are used and passed around between people. Um, so that on-site exhibit, exhibition collateral um, will, need to, will need to be moved and will need to be thought about. And back to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Um, indeed, everyone. Um, as I've said, there's, you know, there's a lot. That's very, very, very top line. Uh, the documents are much more detailed, so I highly recommend it to EMA members, particularly to download those and have a read through and to a certain point start to get engaged in this conversation. Uh, Lee, can I come to you first and ask from this, again, you're representing another industry association, HBAA, which is Hotel Booking Agency Association. You've got and you know hotels as your members as well as all the different agents having over over a hundred different agencies um what are you guys talking about and how are you seeing the market evolving and changing over the coming months so um from engagement with the membership so with whichever side as you say agencies and venues what we're looking at is kind of how we can um, kickstart the consumer confidence as we've just talked about there in terms of the different aspects of the journey of live events and without specific government guidelines at the moment obviously the hotels and venues are working tirelessly to be able to create their own 
guidelines, but what that doesn't provide us with is a standardization, which I appreciate is what the objective here is to be able to provide that. And obviously every corporate will have their own approach to COVID and their own approach to how they see their delegates being safely accommodated in hotels and venues for live events. So from our side, what we're trying to do is to be able to um, offer as exactly what you've done here, that whole pre-engagement. So where you've got delegates who are naturally anxious to travel again, who are naturally anxious to go and um, be in space that they haven't been outside of their own homes for so long. It's actually offering that um, pre kind of presumed asked questions of when you're attending event, what to be, what you can expect. Um, because ultimately it's the unknown for all of us right now in terms of going into a hotel and venue, going into large spaces, going into travel. So the more we can do to preempt um, anxiety and the fact that we've thought about their best interests, we've thought about how the flow of the events will happen, will only naturally provide some assurances that we have their best interests at heart. But ultimately it does come down to delegate choice. So if you are putting on an event and you've done everything you can as a um, employer, but also as a hotel and venue and the agency looking after um, the event from start to finish. The bottom line is the choice comes down to the delegate of whether they actually attend that or whether they do what we do right now. Because as we all know, over the last few months, who would have thought 133 of us are sat face to face having a meeting, but we're not shoulder to shoulder. And all of us agree, you can't get the same experience you get from being shoulder to shoulder as you do face to face. So I think it's about how we educate people that there is going to be a place for virtual meetings moving forward. That probably will be smaller team meetings, one-to-ones, but we also recognise as well it will not replace and it should not replace live events. And what we need to do is obviously what we're doing here is being able to provide that consumer confidence and working with other accredited bodies and other standardisation to be able to kickstart that and to take people on the journey that it is okay and it will be okay to meet shoulder to shoulder as long as everything that we've just walked through and everything that we're walk, working on in the HBA and other um, associations are in place and that it's validated that they're working and how we can work smarter together. Right, thank you Lee. Uh, Samri, g- give us a quick overview on Hyatt's approach, what they're doing, because you've got properties yeah. around the world and different brands so, so it's a very broad brush but Exactly. No, absolutely. I think everything that Mark, Anna and Christopher touched on, we have definitely taken into consideration. And to Lee's point, you're right. You know, when you're working for a global company, you want to bring some sort of a standardization because the same customer booking London is also booking New York. And they want it as easy, as as uncomplicated as possible. So we actually hired a whole legal team that not only our existing legal team, and we came together as a truly global company. And we have compiled a document that we recently shared with all our customers. So if anybody who hasn't seen that, please reach out and I'm happy to share that. Where we really have combined all our standards, bringing, touching on every single touch point of a journey as you enter into a hotel to bring global standardization and literally covering everything that Anna, Mark and Christopher mentioned. Uh, But at the same time, we have also highlighted that a lot of different countries have different regulations in place, and we have to be mindful of that, you know. For example, we talk about the PPP, PPE, in certain countries is actually, they uh, tell you not to wear a face mask as you enter a hotel by law. So you can't force those hotels to be taking those measures. So all of that has been taken into consideration, but for a customer, It's a document and it's really, really powerful, but it really covers every single point. Um, And to your earlier point, you know, flexibility. I think the flexibility will really help us and drive us this forward and building confidence with our customers that again, we can walk shoulder to shoulder as Lee says, Um, it's just a little bit different and we just have to get a little bit creative. And I think that's what a lot of the hotel chains are working on and I'm really proud to be part of that task force within Hyatt to drive that globally. And I know we will talk about hybrid meetings a little bit more in detail. Um, You know, at Hyatt, we are ready. You know, we have kind of compiled three different ways of approaching hybrid meetings because um, great for us that we are seeing some business come in already uh, from a lot of our corporate companies. You know, we're being asked to have a meeting with social distancing. So you have one room where everybody is sat 
within compliance of that com country and we are live webinar and we are connecting globally with the comfort of uh, people's home that do not feel comfortable joining that conference. We have multiple room um, requests right now that our hotels are capable of providing as well. And that's that you're in the same venue having the same conference, but in multiple rooms. Uh, so you do still come together. And we had a request from one of the corporates where they said, we will take the main boardroom as a main setup and we will use 20 of your bedrooms. And each person, again, is in comfort of their own space to be able to connect with that conference. And because if the conference is over three or four days that they can rotate. So one day half of the people are in the main room and the other ones attend that wire bedroom. So as you can see, we are getting super creative right now. Um, and then the other options are multiple rooms and multiple venues, which we are really exploring to depth being a global company. Uh, we get a lot of requests that one conference happening in Tokyo, the delegates are coming from all around the world. So we want to create a platform where um, you can have the same conference in three different locations and have the same content running all together um, and bringing them together again in different locations uh, by connecting them. So we are really exploring all options. Um, a lot of our hotels that are opening in China have already tested and trialed it. And there's a lot of demand from our clients. So I would say there are like four key points um, or five key points that we are really keeping in mind is physical distancing, seamless technology, which will really come to play in these hybrid live events, enhanced hygiene and well-being measures, um, and then food, um, food and um, beverage services and a lot of flexibility. They're changing. Okay, great. All right, Adam, do you want to give us a top line on what you guys at Central Venues are doing? How many properties do you now have? 16 properties now in the UK and one in exploded enormously over the last 10 years. Oh, yeah, so yeah. I'm um, look I just just firstly Richard um want to say a real pleasure to be a part of this cross industry um conversation. Uh thank you for for bringing us into this. Um it's clear to me that the guidelines that you guys have been working on is they're the result of a huge amount of hard work and not just the, th the three of you here involved today, but I know there's other um other members of your organization who've been contributing to it. So um, and what's, what's clear as well for me is that I can see that you have definitely done your homework. They're, they resonate with a lot of what we put into our 18 point plan, but also in, in the MIA with, with the HBA and all the guidelines across. So I think that, that stands us in very good stead with, with these guidelines. So much similar thinking gives you a very, very clear foundation to work from. Um, so what have we been doing in terms of preparation? Um, well, it's outlined in our 18-point plan. Um, our 18-point plan sort of focuses very much on that confidence that Lee, you've, you've alluded to, and, and, and Richard, you mentioned at the beginning. Um, it's six key areas for us. It's um, firstly, the cleanliness and hygiene. Secondly, and I don't think this has been mentioned yet, but the team welfare and training, I think that's a really key bit. Um, thirdly, uh, adapting our spaces. Um, fourthly, the technology and the sporting technologies of, of hybrid. Um, fifthly, the, uh, the, the need to have touch free with that throughout and, and particularly in regards to food. And, and then lastly, actually some market value, um, some great market value in terms of uh, leading in, in terms of the terms of flexibility and things like that. And, and, and we really do believe that that, that um, constitutes a, a set of measures uh, that will, will restore confidence um, to our clients, but confidence only in the tactical to start with and yeah think, right yeah. we need to start looking at how we go further forward than that to to restore confidence beyond um my view on on returning to live um i think that the scale of the event um is going to dictate the rate to which we return um i think very much so um short term that we're, we're virtual embracing virtual um in the midterm we are going to see uh, small meetings i think quite quickly return uh, but then the larger ones probably having to look to adapt and use the hybrid solutions. And I'm talking midterm being from when we're allowed to open to potentially the end of the year. And we're actually already seeing customers take that trans, take that hybrid solution and move on to it for the, for the midterm. And then longer term, I think, yeah, as we've all agreed, virtual is going to continue and uh, online will continue to be to play a part. But face to face um, is the benefits of that are going to drive us um, back more and more to live events and the benefits being that the ability to network that 
the, the, the fact that you can develop relationships. Um, and I love your analogy, Lee, of, of, of we'll be able to be face to face, not side, um, shoulder to shoulder. Um, but, but actually, something that happens at the, the events we, we all forget about is the serendipity of, of bumping into someone or, or picking up uh, someone who you didn't think was going to. You can't create that online. And, and we really know that that will start to drive us back in to, to live events, getting us back to live. Okay, thank you, Adam. Um, so there's some questions coming in and comments in the questions and that. So guys, keep an eye on those. Uh, we'll pull a few of those. But I now want to sort of turn it into a discussion across the panel. Um, think, keep, keep in your mind, you know, keep your answers and stuff pretty short um, and think about the key questions about this. And Anna, you've got some questions about, you know, which would help you communicate to your powers to be, particularly around sort of, contracting flexibility and i'm also thinking part of that should be okay we're not wanting to change corporate contracts for the next 10 years but perhaps we need to be a bit more flexible over the next 12 18 months you're on mute of course of course i'm on mute um so i think a couple of the questions um thinking about this and speak with our legal team as well. Um, in terms of force majeure, what um, changes or what changes have you made to your contracts, particularly around force majeure? So the legal, legal guidance suggests that force majeure provisions should be included or should include pandemics as a force majeure event. So will you be including that going forward if you haven't already? I can um, Emma, say- yeah, please. Yeah, so I think for Hyatt Hotels, we initially, when the pandemic hit us, um, we have force majeure clause in all our contracts. And every single customer who has reached out to us why either cancel it purely because of that, we have actually accepted it and refunded because we have such strong and powerful relationship in place. I would say 80% of our customers, we've been able to accommodate them for future year and move their bookings without any extra charge, keeping the same terms and conditions in mind. Um, So we have worked with every customer has been so different. So we can't say one thing fits everyone. So we have really looked at each individual and accommodated their needs, but all our contracts have force majeure clause and that has been taken into consideration globally for Hyatt. And then that includes pandemics, does it? It does now, yeah, it does now, yeah, because if you look at the standard force majeure clause, it doesn't. Correct. Uh, this is also being seen as act of God, no human control right now till America and China figure it out what happened. <laughs> so um, right now, our force majeure clause has been a little bit adapted and this is now being part of it. Fantastic. And Adam, sorry, Adam, you got anything to add to that? Have you all- Look, I think terms and conditions are continually re- evolving. I think, you know, we've learned a lot over the last um, three months um, of, of what, what needs to be considered. And, and, and look, the terms and conditions are part of that, that negotiation um, of contracts and, and needs, to be, um, needs to be suitable on both sides. So I think it's really important that we keep working towards that and, and actually to some degree work individually on, on, uh, on our contracts with, with customers because it, there may be something that's more important to one as versus to another. So you just need to have that in mind uh, when, you're, when you're negotiating these things. I think we're, we're, we're certainly taking the stance of being as open as we can to, to work individually with each of our customers on, on what their needs are and what they, they, they're looking for. Okay. Can I want to come back on that or something? Sorry, Richard, can I just uh, turn this question around to uh, from a customer point because we have a current uh, current uh, situation where we have actually signed a customer contract. So they didn't sign the hired contract. We do have some corporates that we do that with. And in their contract, they did not have a force majeure clause and they are now cancelling and the hotel is applying cancellation. We have found a middle ground, but how do you approach that situation when the customer contract no longer has force majeure and they want to apply it? And the hotel is saying, well, we told you to sign our contract. You were more protected. How would you approach that from like maybe Anna and uh, Mark from a customer point of view? How would you say to approach that instance? Well, for me, we certainly wouldn't even sign a contract or consider a contract that didn't have a force majeure. So that's why everything runs through our legal team. So, and which is why I think as an industry or anybody that's signing contracts on behalf of the company needs to be clued up as to what these 
these specific things mean. So, um, yeah, for, I mean, certainly for me, it, it, it wouldn't apply. Yeah, I think very, very similar to, um, to Anna. We, force majeure is something that, that we have in our, um, our terms and conditions that we would ask the venue to sign. Um, and, you know, we're now looking at um, having the pandemic added. I mean, it's, it's been added to our, our force majeure um, terms and conditions as well. And I think, you know, almost to Adam's point as well, now it's about being flexible. When we're going out to venues and we're talking to venues, we want um, to have that flexibility on both sides. And, um, and I think it's very important when we talk to the EMA members now about having um, the ability to, to postpone and perhaps to postpone for longer. So, you know, we talk about second waves, we all want to get back to live, but what if something else happens and we have to move that? So whereas you may have looked at a postponement for up to 12 months, I think now corporates are going to be keen to say, okay, if we had to postpone for up to 24 months, is that a discussion that we can have? And I think that's, um, you know, without wanting to be, be kind of too forceful, we would just like to be able to enter into those discussions with um, our partner vendors. And part, of, part of that, Mark, has been the challenge that, well, if you go back to a venue and they can't they can't house you then you've got to go somewhere else with that so that's why kind of you know people are asking for that longer distance and just to quickly add uh, a couple of minutes um one of the things we have learned this is again it's like you you need a you, god forbid you need but you do you need it ha happens around a situation like this that every all of a sudden that everybody realizes the importance of contracts contracts are one of those things that are signed and put in a drawer and have been signed. So we found out with IEMA members quite loosely signed by a lot of people who really shouldn't be signing contracts because they're they're not a director or a you know an authorized signature of those contracts. But it's just been the habit or what just what's happened. It's always been accepted. So that's very much changing changing now. I'm going to come to Diva, guys. I'm also going to reverse the question on behalf of the venues and the suppliers back to the corporate of what what's happening now within your organizations and how is what what's the tone of voice people talking about live events and you know how can you start to see that happening you know are you doing surveys within your executives should we be doing surveys have a think about that while lee i think you wanted to ask something yeah. or comment. Um, i was just gonna say obviously for all of us there's no winners in cancellations regardless of what side of the fence you sit on there's no winners so I think coming back to your point, Richard, about flexibility, where you say there that, you know, a meeting was being housed and then they try and rebook it at the venue and the venue can't accommodate it. That goes back to the corporate having to be flexible, because ultimately, if you've got a date, you need to be the corporates need to be flexible as well, because ultimately, if a venue's um, cancelled space once and what you were saying, Mark, you know, God forbid there's a second wind. Hotels and venues also have budgets. Hotels and venues also are looking at how they can um, be able to accommodate meetings and obviously to keep um, open their doors. And therefore, we need to look at how that flexibility sits on both sides. One of the things that we've um, recently picked up on, we had a venue meeting this week. We had nearly 90 venues on there. Is what does that uh, the selling strategy of, of the space look like now? Because no one likes supplements. The word supplement you know riles people they don't people feel shortchanged so looking at how best to price spaces as well will help us to look at the contracting because one of the things that we've recently found is that not only is there force majeure in the contracts but actually corporates are trying to exercise frustration clauses um, which ultimately means that you know the, the contracts nil avoid straight away but working for both sides, you know, it's about a partnership. It's about how we can work smartly with venues to make sure that that's, that event does go ahead and it goes ahead safely, but with the, the ability to be able to work on it, but also if the space has canceled um, and cancellation charges are then um, contracted. It's whether venues will exercise the need to want to have to pay the cancellation charges there and then, but actually are able to offset that into future events moving forward, because ultimately you're locking into the property, but you're just not locking into that time because there will come a point where venues will potentially say, no, we can't now roll that over for another 12 months. Um, so it's how we work smartly with the venues to make sure that working in partnership there are a winning situation for all sides rather than just being on one side as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to add to, to, to Lee. I think there's, 
you know, we, we've touched on, a lot of us have touched on the hybrid and, and a hybrid does one thing that, that really helps. And that's to some degree, it helps to, to allow people to attend in one or other format. Um, and by allowing people to chat, ultimately we want these people to be able to be at this event. We want you guys to have the opportunity to cr be creative with your event, get back to being creative with your event, making sure that the experience is there for all of, all of the delegates that are joining. And we've got to find, we've got to lead as venues to find solutions that allow you to get back to, to doing that. Um, it's really important to do that and, and taking away this, this, this element that, that frustrates, as you say, and, and giving you back that power to, to get your delegates engaged with their event, whether it's virtually or, or in person. Great, thanks. So, so guys, back to the corporates, what's happening within the corporates um, on, you know, the talk, the chat around the, the, the water box or whatever you want to call it, you know, how is the businesses thinking about going back to live? Where, where are you? Um, so I'll start first so with, with Rathbones, most nearly probably 95% of my events are high net worth private client events. Um, so I think it's, I think it's about really, really knowing a customer. Um, so for me, a high net worth private client event, um, we've had a blackout to the end of October. Realistically, I'm not planning anything this year. Um, if I, if, if one of our sales team came towards, came towards me and they wanted to do something because they need to connect with people, they're probably much younger, much younger, um, in age, probably far less risk. Um, so we would perhaps look at doing something from them, taking the social distancing into place. Um, whilst social distancing was two meters, we couldn't look at doing anything at all. Now it's reducing to a meter square. I think. The, the guidelines we were looking at are probably those groups between sort of 50 to 200 um, with the reduction of the social distancing. Um, I think those type of things for certain areas could go ahead. Um, certainly for me, for the high net worth private clients, um, definitely out to the end of October, I would be surprised if I did anything to the end of this year. Well, it's very interesting because I was talking to a friend of, well, my one of my neighbors yesterday who is a consultant, um, a, you know, a medical consultant, and we were chatting quickly and he was sort of mentioned the one meter thing. He says, people are missing, it's one meter plus. And the plus means something else. So whether it's a screen, whether it's your facing back to back or side to side, you know, it should, the rule is still, and I think there's you know, a two meter rule, um, but the plus allows, if you're doing something else, it allows for the other barrier. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, of course, we're all quickly forgetting that. And I am personally as well, because I was talking about it. Anyway, to digress on that. Mark, what about, what, what about the stuff at, Gold, at Goldman? Yeah, I mean, similar to, to Christopher, I think, you know, we have seen um, lots turn virtual. Um, in person, probably not before kind of November, December. Um, you know, we, we are going to be led by the government advice, um, you know, in whatever shape that may be and also the foreign office travel advice uh, i think the kind of the positive stuff is that different countries are moving at different rates so we can see that although we may not do something in person in london this year for example we may do something that's smaller in frankfurt for that local market um, so you know yes it, it might be seem like it's doom and gloom in the uk and nothing's going to happen in person but actually some of the other markets um, are coming through a bit quicker. But is there a, there's an appetite within the business to start doing live there, events? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certain, yeah, there's certainly an appetite um, to want to get back to live. And I think, you know, the, the various panellists have said, you know, that's, you know, the, the challenges around you can't network on um, on virtual. So, you know, there are, there are meetings that can't happen because the networking is a huge part. You know, people want to get back. You know, everybody... Uh, no one has said that this is the end of um, in-person meetings. So, you know, yes, I mean, the business wants to get back to meeting clients face to face. That's good. Cause that, that, I think that's the big question to the industry of how quick that would be. And Anna, do you have anything to add? I think our first one is actually scheduled for the first week of September um, and it's in Brussels. So we're working very closely with the venue. It was uh, a summer event that should have been the first week of June that we've now pushed back to September, but it's entirely dependent on local guidelines. The numbers for that are up to about 150 people and it's a, a summer evening drinks reception slash party. 
Um, but it entirely depends on government guidelines and whether we can go ahead with that or not. So we're just kind of sitting and waiting um, and you know, just see what we can do um, in the meantime. And then the next one is late September. We're planning a two day um, internal uh, team meeting uh, for between 70 and 90 people. Again, that, that'll be in the Netherlands. So it's entirely dependent on government guidelines. So we're just waiting. Okay. Um, guys, does anybody want to ask each other a question or pick anything out of the questions? We've got like 15 minutes left. Um, yeah. I, can I just, um, one thing I observed um, early on um, regarding the, the, the checklist itself and, and teams, and we, I think we all have a, a role to play in this, whether that's the, the delegates on site or the, the planners themselves um, and, and indeed the suppliers, but actually um, having an understanding of what to do needs to be communicated through to all of the participants um, and so training and, and the implementation of training and, and understanding what it is that's changed for the guys on site I think is important I think it's something that should come into to those guidelines um, as a question from, from from yourselves you know what what provisions have you made how have you educated your team to live and breathe these measures because they're mm -hmm. going to need to so that we can see them in practice when we're having those events. I think that's a really important thing to start to bring in not pri prior to running an event. You want to see it happen. So, I'm yeah, well, to kind of jump in there because um, I know that Ed and his team at uh, Higher Space have done, a, you know, they're creating a training program and everything else. I know that many of our corporate members have been talking to them and we're quite keen to possibly sort of push that out so that there is a, an, a, a, a way of going through a formal process of training. And I also know that many of the companies are doing that internally as well. So, yes. If I may add to that, Richard, just to give you um, a little bit of update on what Hyatt is doing um, globally. So before, because as you know, um, a lot of our hotels are shut down. So we can't just say we turn the key around and the hotel reopens. It actually needs a month of preparation and training before the hotel actually reopens and the staff is brought back and retrained with hygiene and all the measurements of the country and also with the guideline of Hyatt. So we have hired an hygienist. Every single property globally for Hyatt will have an hygienist position that has been recreated. That is um, along with the guidelines that we have put in place with the governance. Um, and they will monitor that and every single person is being trained based on that before a hotel opens. So it's really to rebuild uh, confidence in customer that we are thinking about that. And if we are not trained, how can we actually help you bring your customers to the hotel? Um, so there's a lot of work, I can tell you from a hotel perspective. It's like when you open a hotel from ground up as a new opening, it takes life out of you if you've ever done a new opening. So it's pretty much exactly the same concept Again, yeah. with a twist and with a lot of restrictions. So um, hence, you know, we are trying to work with every partner we can to make them understand how much goes into reopening um, these <clears throat> I was to say, I, was, I watched the Hyatt video this week and I thought it was fantastic in terms of everything that you're doing at your properties. But I do think from the meetings and events side of, of our industry, we are on our back foot. Obviously, the government have issued their uh, recommendations if you are a hotel guest and you become unwell or you display symptoms while you're in a hotel, you should follow X, Y and Z. Um, we don't have the luxury of that in our meetings and events space right now and therefore... It is down to a common sense approach. But Adam, as you say, everybody has the responsibility to take their own responsibility of how they approach this. And that should be absolutely key. And in all joining instructions throughout the lifespan of um, a meeting and event that people take responsibility. It is a riddle um, reported disease to the government. And ultimately, we are all responsible to make sure that we, we pay our part in that because none of us want a second wave and all of us want to get back to some sort of whatever yeah. normal will be. So therefore, by having these sort of protocols in place, it's all of our responsibility from start to finish of how we exercise those and how we respect um, the guidelines that we are so desperately trying to put in place without having government guidelines. So Absolutely. let me, and Anna, I know, sorry, and Anna, Anna's got a load of that stuff in the documents that she's produced. And there's a the big question around GDPR. I think got, you'll be absolutely fine to ask that. The, the data will be held by the organization, the company, uh, not necessarily the hotel, and the, the track and trace information that is requested 
uh, will be held by the company for that period. But again, those official guidelines have yet to come out. But we know that in Switzerland, in Spain, as they're now open, it is the responsibility for the organising company, not their agency or anything else, but the organising company to keep and retain all that information. Um, but I, I want to throw out a couple of quick questions because the, um, around risk and crisis. The so risk management is the whole process of planning, pre-planning, what if, what if, what if. But the questions are that, God forbid, a crisis does happen or something. So let's say, um, let's say all this has been lifted. We're now in the first quarter of next year and everything else. But what is, and I have a conference booked to go into Leicester next week for 80 people in the Hyatt, if there's a Hyatt in Leicester. Um, but then you get this peak in Leicester and they, they presume this is what the government are going to do. They're going to lock down a city or an area. That means I can't, presumably I wouldn't be able to hold my event. What happens in those sort of situations, both from a corporate point of view, what would you expect uh, and do, but also yes. from a, you know, let's say Adam or some, some, some you know, that, you know, your venue the gets the closed. Yeah, so I think exactly what we have done right now um, is really working with that customer and what they want to achieve. A lot of our customers are saying, this is an annual event, be flexible and let's move it to future. And so the new terms and conditions that we have recontracted helps support and it's a win-win situation from both sides. To your point, we can also not continuously move that event 50 times but right now we are telling a lot of our corporates, do not contract. We will hold your space and we will keep you updated till closer to time when you know exactly when to make a decision because a lot of work goes into contracting. So if that Leicester situation happens, we will be as flexible as we have been right now to say, do you, do you think this event will happen again? If not, we cancel and have to refund or we are asking because hotels also don't have a pot of money just sitting there. We're also saying we, if you think it will work for you, we can hold on to that deposit for your future event with Hyatt. And a lot of customers are very happy to do that. Some customers are saying, sorry, we, this was one off and we won't be. And the flexibility is to refund. There's, again, the force measure will come to play here. You're, you're saying we give you a total, it's, a, it's your choice, Mr. Client. We'll give you a total refund. Or Absolutely. Hold the money and roll it over for your next event. Absolutely. Holding the same prices that you've got now or better well this okay. is what we have done this year to be honest yeah. uh, as lee said before all right, all right let me sorry let me let me cut you short on that because i want to grab a couple of other things chris uh adam how what's your thoughts on that i think look it's it's all part of business recovery isn't it i mean you know if if it were fire in in the same location or if it were if it were riots or anything like that in the same location, it's it's about having a business recovery um, strategy for for us our, our venues are located in london so one's first look to say well are, you able, are we able to shift you to another venue? That's what I was looking um, for. <laughs> that's the main thing to start looking for first. If we can't do that, then obviously we're going to go down the route of, look, everything's shut down and no one can get in. But, but I think it's, it's more about trying to work with the customer to say, what's our plan? And we have added to that plan, given the, the, the pandemic over this, over this period. So, yeah. Yeah. And you guys as corporates, what, how would you like to react to this? see a reaction to that sort of situation how would your businesses be reacting and how would you like to see the supply relationship reacting thoughts anna you're off mute you can go first it's it's difficult isn't it i mean it's definitely a suck it and see situation and it's not a one size fits all um i think a lot of it is going to be bespoke to the relationship you've got with the venue to the type of event that it is um it, there's going to be so many different um exceptional circumstances around it. So um, it's, a, it's a hard one to call. I have a very quick question for the venues though, and something that I'm not seeing covered very much, um, that I think is hugely important is your CSR policy. So it, you know, six months ago when we were looking at events, there were a lot more green events, we were doing away with the single use plastics, but then I'm hearing this week, there's venues that are doing, um, you know, sort of one time or, or, or single print menus, for example. So surely you're just, you're avoiding one issue and sweeping that under the rug in order to, I mean, I don't doubt that the health and safety and the cleanliness now, everyone is, is going to be on the forefront. But what about the other stuff that shouldn't be forgotten either? 
Yeah, look, sustainability is, 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 a, is a key factor, and I agree with you. And actually, something that we've been able to start looking at beyond um, these hygiene factors, or as I call yeah. them, protective measures. Um, actually, um, this came about from that a, a conversation I had with um, some travel planners who were, who were saying that for the first time, we have had to take in to consideration the journey from home to work. It's the first time we've had to consider that. And, and actually by having to consider that, we now need to think about sustainable solutions to get people to work. So for instance, one of the things we've come out with is, is to, to offer cycle parks within our, within our um, venues, which allows people that flexibility to take a bike to the, the event, park it at our venue safely and securely and avoid them choosing a taxi or, or, a, um, or a, a cab to get there. So yes, we do need to start weaving this green element and, and the sustainability element in. And I think now we're getting closer to um, the hygiene factors being resolved. Uh, we can start to start weaving that into, into what we do as protocols. I think with CSR though, Anna, I'm sure you agree is that whenever there's something, so whether the market crashes or the market go explode, CSR is something, unfortunately, goes on the back burner and it's not right and it's not wrong it's just reality unfortunately but when speaking to venues as well all the additional um, protocols they've put in place I was speaking to a hotel the other day and they were saying um, their bedroom it's going to be an extra two pounds a night off their bottom line just to make sure that that guest that stays there is safe for the additional cleaning so obviously venues are at the point where the hotels and venues are at the point where they're putting all these additional measures in to make delegates safe to make guests safe but ultimately that's coming off their bottom line. And at the moment they're in a survival mode um, in terms of reopening and kickstarting their own businesses. So therefore with regards to sustainability, that may be a little bit further on the back burner than just getting their doors open and getting people and getting consumer confidence, but it will come back. And we all agree it will come back and it needs to come back. But right now it's about survival and it's about consumer confidence and doing things safely. Yeah. I think we've seen it with the NHS. Yeah, I mean, sure. What they've had to do to keep people alive and everything else yeah. has, there's a lot of csr stuff they've had to throw out the window Absolutely. there everything right. disposable it's disposable disposable it's not good it's for the not environment good. It's but, yeah. yeah uh guys we're, give... we're coming to an end i'm happy to keep going on this if you guys are. i know people got uh, other agendas but let's give another five minutes if we can um yes, i, need you. I, I can ask to your question richard if you want some I few tippers of what hyatt has done we actually uh, sustainability is one of Hyatt's pillar, which is called Thrive. And we are trying to keep up with that quite heavily. Um, so a couple of things that we have put in place, which is in our document, and you must have seen that Lee, if you saw the video, we have removed all paper from all rooms. Every touch point is gonna be all QR code. So you could literally download a QR code to order your menus from the restaurant, room service, anything that you need from a hotel. You, it's, it's literally a QR code. Um, we are also looking at a lot of options because we had gone away from plastic water bottles to having the recycled ones, which are not hygienic. So we are coming with alternatives on that as well. So we are not really getting rid of that. It has to stay our priority. And yes, we are trying to, it's like trying to survive right now. Uh, but we can't go back to where we were 10 years ago. We are just making sure we get creative. And I think the QR code, whoever came up with that in Hyatt was absolutely brilliant to make yeah. sure we eliminate that paper side of it. Uh, so I think there are little things that they're doing. And, you know, their bedrooms are already quite sustainable in regards to the showers were replaced. Years ago, there's been so much work gone into the big chain hotels. So I think these small measures will still help us all um keep that momentum going I, I think there'll be new normals as well for example we you know housekeeping in bedrooms when you stay for more than one night which would be amazing for the hotels um who needs to have your room serviced if you're staying for more than no. one night those yeah. sort of so. will, should, should yeah. be removed and they will this be is, now yeah. to remove these sort of protocols that because we've always done it that way now's the time to put a stake in the ground and make more efficient change Correct. to focus um, on the right Exactly. And we are saying, don't you, you know, you don't change your towels every day either. So, you know, and there's a little card normally in the bedrooms that you just put it on and your room is not touched and you get like few world of Hyatt points in return. So it's a win-win. You can make your own bed. Richard, I don't know whether you've, <laughs> Richard, I don't know whether you've seen Melanie's made a, a good point on the, on the, 
on the chat um, just that there's there's still some some confusion over over the ability to open uh, and run meetings I, I'd be good just to go round the group here and consensus to, to give her some some reassurance that, that we all understand at the moment we still do not have a restart date for right. um, absolutely so, so. Um, Melanie for that I think all of us here are, are saying it's not yet um, yeah no, no, we're, we're very much, we're having these conversations because there's a lot of work to be prepared to reopening. You know, I think everyone's thinking that we're hoping that we're going to be able to start to open up in the final quarter, so September onwards, for meetings and events, but we do not know yet. And we're waiting for the government to tell us. Um, as a BVEP member, uh, which also I know that... Um, HBAA are we're talking with the BBP which talks to this the DCMS which talks to the government about live events and particularly from our point of view of course it's the business to business or business to employee stuff um, not, um, but yeah and we're waiting for that to happen so yeah, yeah and just to um, say the HBA issued a further lobby letter template on our website today which anybody it is available to anybody to download um, in there also outlines who your new your local MP is. There will be another one going out next week following hopefully additional government guidelines on the 6th. So the more that we can lobby to the government, you know, we need that date. We need those guidelines for, to be able to kickstart this. So any support from all the 106 people on here and your network, you know, we, we have to have a voice across this industry to get ourselves kickstarted. Yeah. I mean, is that I'm going to start to wrap up now. I think we could probably carry on talking for another hour very easily. I think it's um, it's been a great start. Um, I think there's two sides to this. I think there's work from EMA's point of view that we can now look at this. We've got some, look, some great comments and questions that, again, sit un unanswered. I think we can have a brainstorm, a workshop um, on some of that, even like, even around like the, the crisis question that I threw out, what if, what if, what if. Um, so we can do some stuff internally on that and develop and evolve our thinking. Um, and I think sort of cross industry, there's you know, much more greater collaboration, open discussions like this. Um, it's great to work with uh, the HBA, Epcom, MIA, um, you know, the hotel groups. It's good to have this big, big brush conversations um, with people around these issues and challenges and how we how we approach them together and how we adapt yeah anybody got any final comments they'd like to say no so, thank you richard for guys this thank you so so much for, for, for getting involved and engaging thank you everybody for attending i hope you found that useful it is the start and um, next week on thursday we've got a a presentation, a talk um, by a young lady that I've known for many years, Shanali Rodriguez, who is a consultant, advisor, mentor, uh, particularly in the women's world. Um, she's going to speak about confidence and presentations. I've, I've seen that she's done a TED talk, uh, you, so you can watch her on TED talks, um, and it's really, really interesting. It's great because you guys have got a lot of work to do to influence people and tell them what they're doing and what I felt I felt what Shanali does is, is really useful there about how to be learn and prepare and everything else for presentation um, presentation skills etc so that's next Thursday guys gonna wrap it now thank you very much indeed greatly appreciate your time um, have a wonderful weekend I hope we're gonna have some nice weather thank you <laughs> uh, bye. thanks bye, bye.